I didn't plan to go out of my country because my country was fine, was okay. I, um, there was a future for me. I never thought one day to leave my country because all my life I left there, studied there to make it a better place one day. Rwanda uh, started getting the walls in that time, in the year of 1990. And the minute they attacked the country, I became a displaced. And then suddenly, the war started in Rwanda, where people were killing each other, and uh, we were forced to leave our capital city to another province. And the war also met us there, where my father was killed uh, in front of me. My sister, young sister also, was killed there. And then we had to run. My mother died on our way running. Also my two small brothers died there. So I was forced to run away from my country. I was forced to join the army because there was fight in my country. I started to think and make a plan to run one day if I can give time. Because I never killed anybody in my life and I never thought even of killing anybody for any reason. I suffered a lot during those three years of war while I was still in my country. When I completed my metric, I couldn't go back to my village because my parents were displaced. Being a frustrated person inside the country, and that always gives me another way of understanding people of South Africa who face frustration because I went through the same journey while I was still in my country. We enter into a covenant that we shall build a society in which all South Africans, both black and white, will be able to walk tall without any fear in their hearts, assured of their inalienable right to human dignity, a rainbow nation at peace with itself and the world. When I left my country, I had to choose a place to go. Uh, there are two main reasons that I chose to come to South Africa. A historic reason and this nice name of South Africa, a rainbow nation. The historic reason is that South Africans went through struggle till when they got their freedom. And I say this country, they have experience about what is human right. If I go to this country, they will consider me. They will know what I went through because they've been through that. When we in the battlefield, I was with two friends. We decided to put it, the plane in place now and run away. By the grace of God, in Zambia, we met one driver who was also a Congolese who helped us in the truck to take us in South Africa, telling us that it was really a good place where more refugees people were getting support far away from home. Tanzania, we lived in a, in, a, in a refugee camp for almost two years. That is when I had my first child. 1996 October, towards December, they start threatening refugees to go back. That is when we went home back under shootings. Because once you caught again, you are in prison forever. They attacked him when he was on a soccer field, about to kill him, but he did not die on the scene. Then he ended up in a hospital. 
And when they were taking him in a hospital, the ambulance, people who were there were saying, he was listening to them, but like these ones, do they think they are really welcomed? We discovered that we were wrong by going back, though we did not choose to go back. And then we left Rwanda again. using uh, any easy way of transport. We're looking for the tougher one, where we're not gonna face officials in any way. We were thinking of going to Mozambique, but as uh, other guys shared with you, we knew also that there is a change in South Africa. Democracy is was something that we don't know about in Rwanda. They've been talking about democracy, but to see it in a practical life, we did not see it. When we reached in Mozambique, we found challenges, especially of language. You know, when you are running away, when you are fleeing, when you are fleeing your country, there is no one you can trust. I, I could see someone at a distance dressing like us. We had to run away from that person because we did not know if it's for the government or it's for us. My husband caught malaria on his way, on our way. He was very sick. And I had to carry my son on the back and whatever we had, a small bag. It was not small, but to carry it with the child on the back, it was tough. A syndicate of the people who arrange how the people to cross. They said, we are going to ask people to switch off electricity in a fence. It means you need to be fast as you can. Remember, I had a husband who was sick and a child. Those are the fence, three layers of fences. When I reached there, I questioned myself, how am I going to do this? That was three o'clock in the morning. I have a son at the back. I say, if I go between these layers, someone will poke my son and he will cry. And they told us, no cough, nothing. That's where I always say, God, you are amazing. Because you were given a warning that no cough, no cry for those who had the babies. It happened so. I had to follow those people running, sweating. That was three o'clock in the morning. Sweating not because it was hot. Fear. In the bush there, they had to say, those who are going to Deben, this one. Then we found ourselves in another small bucky towards Mpangeni. And that bucky took us from there to Deben. When I arrived in South Africa, life was not easy. But I had to work hard to survive. When I came, I came in my 20s. I was still young. I was alone. Uh, no brother, no uncle, no friend. I was just alone. It was a nice, nice country to see with buildings, with light. And people were more friendly on that time. But it was not easy for us to find accommodation. As we were so excited, as they told us that to be in a safer place, sleeping outside was not a problem. We'll gather with the others, get night and go by the beachfront, looking at the sea, and spend our night. When we reached the midnight, it was July, it was winter, but we had those warm jackets since we left Malawi on, on us. We never bathed for the whole week on our way. We found the police there, they had to close their office, but they, because they could see it was cold, and we were with the small kids. They allowed us to stay in their corridor where it's a bit warmer. And they closed, they went without no toilet, nothing, but we were protected. I had no money in my pocket. 
I had to look for a job as a gardener to cut grasses for people. I did that for three months. I remember I bought a small tent and just to cut hay around on the road. That's how I was progressing in life. But the secret that I had in me, I was a Christian. I did all these praying and trusting uh, into our God. After some days, after receiving our papers from the Oma face, we had no choice but to take what was on offer. So I had to go to do the car guard during the day and at night go and do the security job. For almost a year, I couldn't have even time to sleep on my bed. On the first day they gave us that paper, which was written a prohibited person. It was not easy because of the paper we had, prohibited person. You were hiding it from anyone because I knew what it means to be a prohibited person. Then uh, we started standing on the road like miserable people to, with our children because we couldn't afford it. My son was two years at that time. I couldn't afford any crash. Wherever I stand, I was with my son. After a year, I was saving money. I was informed that there are trainings in refrigeration. If I go for refrigeration, I can uh, prosper in, or move from one step to another step. I used to go house to house and knocking to each door, asking them if they have some fridges or stoves to, uh, to fix. The tent that I was using, I left it with one uh, Zulu guy who was my friend. I trained him about hair cutting, so he took over and I continued with the refrigeration. After a year doing the fridges, I managed to open a workshop, a small workshop in Pangemi. I employed three guys, um, local guys. Soon I received my certificate. It was so nice, I was so happy. Then I started to introduce my CVs in companies here. Glory be given to God. I received a call one day from a company that I introduced my CVs. security guard in order for me to put money together so that my wife may come here. You know, people have that perception that any woman standing on the road is selling the body. And uh, they would come say, I got 20 rand only. I got 30 rand. Come, wanting you to go and sleep with him. And that was like an insult. And I knew my son, though he's two years, but he's growing. Why is he going to grow up in this situation of this negative language about the mother? For us to survive, I need to make sure my child doesn't face what I'm facing. What I need to do, I will eat less, but I need to keep this child away of what we are facing on the road. We sat and we said, how are we going to change life? Are we going to die as a car guard? But he went there with a lot of challenges of the language. He managed to complete his master's. A minute they employed him, 
because I was so exhausted bodily. I was very tired doing kaga, standing as a woman, you pregnant until you give birth and you raise a child. That project is now 11 years and we look out, we're looking after 150 kids. About 70% they are South Africans this time. South Africa became like my home. I started to build my life with hope that I'll be something that's going to be strong. And with the savings that we had, we decided to buy our first car. guys standing there looking and laughing even at me by trying to put the fire off with my jacket and I look at the car burning 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 until it's finished I couldn't believe it that the same people that were good to us started to, to, to act a bit funny against us. Everyone was victimized in the company if you're a foreigner because of that position. We started to receive a death threat that if we cannot leave, we lose our life. For the sake of our life and our families, we decided to take what the company put on offer. No amount of frustration or anger can ever justify the attacks on foreign nationals. We condemn the violence in the strongest possible terms. The attacks violate all the values that South Africa embodies, especially the respect for human life, human rights, human dignity, and Ubuntu. some noise. I'll wake up and go out. And I saw that people were burning ties. And they were singing. Bambe, Bambe, Bambe. I said, to whom are they saying? Bambe. I took my phone. I phoned one of the brothers was working around, was driving. He told me, Pastor, where are you? I said, I'm in the house. He said, can't you see what is happening outside? There are people coming already that's attacking foreigners. I had no time. And I couldn't speak and explain everything to my children. I look at the place. I couldn't believe it. But I had to go. I told my wife to go with the kid. That I will stay and fight. Because it belonged to me. And I get it legally. But looking at the fact that my children are going to be safe only 
If I'm there with them, I have to live. That is when I'll decide to go with them and leave everything behind. It was so bad. But we had to rush and get refuge in the church where we find a shelter where we are today. Me, my three angels, and my wife was pregnant, eight months already, and sleeping on the floor till today. With that workshop, with that Bucky, I managed to get some money and I get married. I'm married now with four kids. I'm holding a postgraduate diploma in management now. And uh, I'm an evangelist in Pan Christian ministry. My wife is working. My children are schooling. And uh, I work with different NGO in the frontier. enjoying living in the rural area, living and working with the local people because I speak Zulu. Sometimes when I speak in Zulu, they will say, no, you, you are not from outside, you are from here, because I was really integrated. It was a safe place for me because there are so many foreigners or refugees here in Durban. I said, let me come and stay with them because there I was like alone in that place. And when I came to this side, I had to stop my, my, my work, my workshop. I left my workshop. So I had to go look for security jobs. So I did that for a year. Now my children are grown. They were asking me now, why people are killing each other. So I had to sit with them and explain to them in a Christian way, not to create hate, but they were not satisfied because they want to know why. It really affected me because my family, my children are afraid, my wife also. I, I have to take her to work every day. She's afraid because she's also a refugee. She went through many difficult. She's like traumatized. Also, being a refugee in this uh, country also, I don't know who to trust now. Because sometimes I was, um, before I was free, talking to anybody, go and ask for help for, to any, for anybody, but there's a fear. Some people are not responding positively when they found out that you are a foreigner. So we are really uh, traumatized. We are really, we live in fear. There are some places where we don't go but before we used to walk freely in those places. The recent xenophobic attacks in our city affected us as a community, as a church. I met one of my friends at night, Malawian friends. They were packing their vans at night. You, you know, my township, Chesterville, was, was not much affected by, by the, the recent attacks. I asked them, why are you going? Why, why can't you stay? Because I mean, we will keep you safe, and they said, no, no, man, uh, we, are, we are too scared. We would rather go, maybe come back when everything is, is settled. I can relate to what our, our brothers are going through because my, my pigmentation is strong, as you can see. So I've been, <laughs> I've been mistaken for a foreigner, and what, what I am I'm speaking about, I, I think I do get a sense sometimes of what they are going through because there are some hot spots that I cannot go to. In response to the recent xenophobia challenge in, in Durban, um, the, the government of South Africa has come in for a lot of criticism for failing to bring unity and to address issues 
around xenophobia from 2008 to 2015. And I think that we as a church also need to put up our hands and say that we have also failed to address issues of uh, different cultures and different races and different languages and different nationalities getting to know each other better because ultimately God has an intent that through the church His manifold wisdom should be made known. again interact maybe have incorporated services with them we we, we, we we may struggle in terms of the language barrier but if if we can reach out to our brothers I think that also will go a long way in educating even our 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 audiences you know that foreigners are not a threat to us but they are decent human beings they are brothers and sisters in the Lord so if we can do that I think it will go a long way in showing the world that we are one body. To some extent, the xenophobia challenge of the last month or so has forced a conversation that perhaps we should have been having before. But we've got to realize that we, we cannot go back to doing church the way that we've done it in the past. That there has to be a convergence between churches. And we have to become more aware of churches in the city that are perhaps different to our own. The Durban Dialogue Initiative has, has been an invitation for people to start to get into dialogue to have the hard discussions, to hear each other's stories. We realize that this is not limited just to the city of Durban. Durban Dialogue is what we've called it, but this is for any city. We have not related as much as we should to our, our brothers and sisters, and we, we opened up a gap for for them to be to be isolated that we as a church have a responsibility to associate with our 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 brothers and sisters we are obligated by scripture in fact to to welcome our 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 foreigners some have run away from really bad situations if we can open our doors if we can relate i believe our our foreign brothers and sisters will feel much safer in our city When I got on that meeting, that is where I changed my mind. And I get in the point to understand that not everyone was against foreigners. That there were people who were still there to support us and uplift us. That is where I changed the way I was seeing things and get hope that tomorrow is going to be better. If I'm raising a child on this land, this child should have a complete sense of what the country did to us. The country accepted me, allowed me to be in university. I want my kids to be happy. They don't know any other country besides South Africa. That's why I'm raising them like South Africans. And I wish every refugee Regardless of the pain, we shouldn't poison our children because they are the future of South Africa, regardless of what the other people think. We are here, we belong here. Thank you. 
Mom, Father.